On the eighth day of October, Halloween gave to me eight Jerry's vamping, seven Jody's oinking, six body swapping, five reeds a wolfing, four drunken uncles, three werewolf colonies, two spooky sisters, and a psycho who killed Janet Lee. Hey everyone, welcome back to yet another edition of the 31 Days of Halloween, the 2021 edition, a year that sounds like it's somehow in the future. Uh, <laughs> we have a great one for you today, uh, by my own estimation, and that's the one that counts, isn't it? Uh, so, I, uh, I I thought about briefly doing kind of a run of, of vampire movies, and uh, then I decided, eh, no, maybe not so much, we kind of did that last year. But one movie that we left out of last year's discussion is a personal favorite of mine. And that is, of course, the film Fright Night from the year of our Lord, 1985. Uh, Fright Night is uh, near and dear to my heart. This is uh, another one of those movies that kind of like the Amityville Horror is a movie that I just saw a ton when I was a kid. Uh, I mean, a whole lot. It was sort of my go-to vampire movie, and uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I think the performances in it are terrific. Uh, I'm a big Roddy McDowell fan, and I think that his take on that Peter Cushing-esque, uh, Peter Vincent character is absolutely the best. Uh, I think he's just a delight in this movie. And as a supporting actor, I know they don't give out uh, posthumous Academy Awards for horror movies from 1985. Should have won an Oscar. That's my opinion about it. Um, but not only do you have that, you have Chris Sarandon, who is quite good uh, in, in pretty much everything. You know, he's a really talented actor. And he plays this just right uh, as the vampire Jerry Dandridge. Uh, William Ragsdale as as Charlie, the teenager who realizes that there is a vampire living next door to him. Uh, you've got Amanda Bierce as his girlfriend Amy. Stephen Jeffries, who, like, this is the controversial one because a lot of people don't care for his performance as Evil Ed. I love it. I think that it is spot on. He is he is the right kind of weird and over the top and goofy. And, like, I knew kids like that. I almost was that kid. Not quite, but I was close. Uh, when, I, <laughs> when I was a kid uh, in high school myself, uh, you've got a guy named Jonathan Stark playing uh, Billy Cole. And uh, so it, it's got a really solid cast. Um, the premise is just short of brilliant, which is, hey, what if Rear Window, but instead of Raymond Burr, it was a vampire? And you so happen to have a neighbor uh, next door to the vampire who is a teenager who's kind of obsessed with vampire and horror movies. And for some of the kids in the 80s, you know, this uh, keep in mind, this was sort of the, the golden age of video horror, you know, straight to video horror when VHS uh, tapes were circulating and um, kind of like rejuvenating in a in you know, in a vampiric way uh r resurrecting in some cases movies that didn't necessarily do great in the theater but would do fantastic on home video and i think maybe fright night falls into that category to some degree uh i you know if i really cared i would have done some research and i didn't but i i assume that's the case because i know i watched it a ton when it was on uh home video and I knew a lot of people in the same boat. So this is all apocryphal uh, in my storytelling, but uh, it don't matter. That's uh, that's what's real to me. And if uh, this pandemic situation has taught us nothing else, it's that what you believe in your gut matters more than facts. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, directed and written by the, uh, the great Tom Holland, who also uh, directed Child's Play... Uh, he wrote Psycho 2. He directed Thinner. Um, he's still working, by the way. Uh, you know, is doing his his, uh, his dark business still. Uh, recently did a, a little anthology called Tom Holland's Twisted Tales, 
and uh, Rock, Paper, Scissors it was the last thing he did from 2017, which uh, is a movie that, strangely, I never saw. Uh, and I, I should probably correct that. Um, because, I like again, I think Tom Holland has a, a, a great vibe. Um, at any rate, in addition to directing um, this terrific movie, uh, he also did... Didn't he do The Langoliers? He did do The Langoliers. Uh, or at least a couple of episodes. Was it only two episodes? Anyway, doesn't matter. He did The Langoliers as well, which is a, a mini series that I don't think is great, but I kind of have a lot of time for in my own uh, dark way. Anywho, um, so he wrote and directed this. It's terrific. Uh, and the, the story, like I said, is very simple. A kid who loves horror movies realizes that a vampire has moved n in next door to him. He tries to convince... Uh, the police of this, when that fails, he goes to the local horror host, a guy named uh, Peter Vincent, um, who, like I said, is very much a Peter Cushing uh, kind of guy. In fact, the name is a combination of uh, Peter Cushing and Vincent Price. And so, he, you know, when that fails, uh, the vampire realizes that Charlie's girlfriend looks a whole lot like some girl that he liked back in the, you know, 1700s or whatnot. And so, uh, the race is on, right? It's, it's a vampire and his familiar, played by Jonathan Stark, um, versus a teenager and his band of misfits. Uh, and, you know, that is it. That's the whole story. And that kind of simplicity really works in this movie's favor because it's really just a framework to do some fun gags. Um, whether it's the, the scene where this vampire assaults Charlie after Charlie calls the police. Um, and, and you know, the vampire gets into his bedroom and, and fucks him up a little bit. Uh, which, by the way, has one of my favorite moments in the whole movie. And it, it's one of the things that I like most about Fright Night is that the vampire, Jerry Dandridge, isn't some slavering monster. He is at times, but, you know, when he's not all vamped out he is very much a regular kind of dude and a very attractive man, uh, capable of seducing, uh, you know, the people around him with his charm alone and not just his vampire, you know, mesmerizing powers or whatever. And he tells Charlie like, Hey, I'm going to give you something. I don't have a choice. Forget you ever saw me. And then Charlie tries to pull out a cross on him and, uh, Chris Sarandon has one of the best deliveries of the word fool. It is such a, like, I'm, I gave you every opportunity in the world not to fuck this up, and you fucked it up anyway. It's that level of fool that he delivers there, and it's absolutely terrific. Um, so he's great as the vampire. I like the fact that he is both malevolent, but also kind of understandable. Like, when it comes to Amy he's not just being a monster about it. He, I mean, he's still a monster, but, uh, he wants, uh, his love back. You know, it, it kind of presages the, uh, a Coppola Dracula in that way. I mean, at no point does Jerry Dandridge say that he's crossed oceans of time for Amy, uh, the, the girlfriend, but it's not that far off. You know, there, that's definitely the implication is that, he kind of wants her to be um, his companion. And there there are a lot of moments like when he puts the bite on her. Uh, you know, she's very nervous and very scared. And he tries to kind of soothe her in his own vampire way, uh, which is a really nice moment. I really dug that. And um, then you have Peter Vincent, who is the you know, a horror host who has just been fired and doesn't really believe in any of this bullshit, but suddenly is in a position where he's at fighting honest to goodness vampires and it freaks him out. He's kind of a coward at heart uh, and, and doesn't want any part of it. Uh, but Roddy McDowell is so funny and so sympathetic. And when he does get heroic in this, it's kind of wonderful and I, I just love all of that stuff. Uh, I think the character of Evil Ed, the one that I, I think is the most controversial. I've heard people complain about Evil Ed the way I complain about Shelley from Friday the 13th Part 3. Um, but I do think he is 
that kind of awkward, you know, kind of gawky teenager who's very into horror movies and, and the macabre. And that was something that was considered especially weird. Less so these days, I think. I, th- I think that the world in general uh, for, for teenagers is alternately more accepting and also more difficult to navigate all at the same time in that you can be a nerd and pursue your own interests and all that kind of stuff. But there's also very rigid, uh, very rigid um, sort of guides, some Gardo Caminos, if you will, of, uh, of keeping you on, on the path of what you should and shouldn't say about people and, and that sort of thing. So I think there's, I, I think on that level, it's much more difficult, but I also think uh, and probably standards of beauty are just crazy because of all the Instagram stuff, uh, if, if the data is to be believed. But that said, I think that being interested in weird shit is less uh, of a thing. But if you're a teenager and or have teenagers, uh, let me know. Because uh, my, my impression is that you can kind of be a nerdy horror fan and that's sort of okay these days. But at the time that this movie was filmed... Uh, not so much, you know, it was considered like maybe you're into Satanism. Generally, you were probably into heavy metal music, although, uh, that was not me. Uh, I was into both, uh, easy listening <laughs> and classic rock and horror movies. Um, you know, well, listen, I'm not going to pass up a James Taylor. That's all I'm saying. But, uh, but so Fright Night, especially in the embodying that character of Evil Ed, was sort of celebrating that that kind of person, the the monster kid, uh, as they are often called. And uh, Evil Ed is also, you know, because he's put upon, he's an easy mark for Jerry. You know, there's another nice moment. Again, this is Jerry not using his vampire powers of mesmerism. It's just him being sort of charming and, and sympathetic where he tells, you know, uh, Evil Ed, hey, if you just take my hand, they'll never laugh at you anymore. I won't let them. But because Evil Ed is kind of bumbling, even in his afterlife, as soon as uh, Evil Ed gets turned into a vampire and goes to uh, Peter Vincent to take him out, um, he gets a cross to the forehead, which disfigures him. Which also has one of my favorite deliveries in the movie, where Evil Ed says, The Master will kill you for this, but not fast slowly oh so slowly oh it's so good i love it so much uh it you know and that's getting to the heart of of why i wanted to talk about this movie this might be my favorite vampire movie um it's not the technically the best you know from an objective kind of point of view there are other vampire movies out there that are, are probably more you know, sophisticated and, and that kind of thing. It's no let the right one in or, or something like that, which is a much more uh, thoughtful film and and, and certainly um, a deeper film. But Fright Night just kind of rocks, you know? It, it portrays all the things I like about vampires, like, oh, that sometimes they turn into mist and Evil Ed turns into a wolf at one point. Uh, which has some great practical effects. That's another thing about this movie. We'll talk about that in just a second. But um, it, it's just fun. It, it's having fun with the premise. Th- there's even a great extended sequence uh, that involves a big dance scene, you know, where Jerry is stalking Amy and, and Charlie. Um, which, interestingly, I, re- I saw the Edgar Wright documentary not long ago on, uh, on Sparks, uh, the... Uh, kind of eclectic electronic band and I remember thinking as I was watching I was like this is really good but it almost feels like this is a a made up band and then when watching it again this time I realized that one of the songs playing in the club is a Sparks song and and I really like it and it was another moment of like oh wow I can't believe I never knew who Sparks was uh, until recently, and I've actually been listening to them all my life in one of my favorite movies. So, anyway, um, in uh, back to uh, enjoying the premise and so forth. Uh, yeah, it, it it really explores all kinds of different kinds of vampire lore, and the you know, a giant monster bat makes an appearance. 
Uh, the practical effects, uh, which I, I alluded to earlier, are just fantastic. Um, it, they really hold up. There's some like reverse shots and a little bit of CGI, a little a little early um, kind of math work done with uh, with with CGI and some animation. Um, not in CGI, I suppose. I suppose it is just animation that they're using there, but uh, doing it in, in kind of a matte way that um, doesn't look great. It, again, one of those things that if you did this movie today, which they did with the remake, um, you would just do all of that as CG. But uh, I like it, I, I like it here in this film, but the practical effects are what blow my mind. You know, I, I like the fact that when Jerry Dandridge gets fucked up, he becomes more vampire-y. Uh, more of a beast and uh, he's got that great laugh at the end when he thinks that he's cornered Peter Vincent and is about to uh, you know g get away with uh, a knight that was supposed to be uh, his kind of grand triumph and has gone tits up on him um, where he, he does that ah 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 you know I can't even do it it's good it's Chris Randon being awesome uh, it's so good um yeah, and even the final dispatching of our vampire in this, I think, works really well. I think it's really good. Uh, it, you know, it it there. In fact, there's some green flame effects in that that I'm like, I'm not a hundred percent sure how they did that. They probably just mix some chemical with some other chemical, and that's the result. But uh, it's really good. Yeah. So, like, I like the relationships between the characters. I like. Uh, the, the mom is great. Uh, Charlie's mother, who is, you know, this kind of 80s single mom who offers her kid Valium in, uh, a little bit of social commentary, I would argue. Um, uh, which is, uh, uh, I mean, just terrific. So, yeah, it, I mean, if you haven't seen Fright Night in a long time, you totally should. Fright Night is awesome. Uh, there are things I like about the remake, but it just doesn't hold nearly a candle uh, to what I enjoy about this one. And that might be, uh, you know, is it a, a factor of having grown up with the movie? Possibly, you know, that that is certainly... Uh, I, like, I, I, I know that I have nostalgia for this film. There is no doubt about that. But I think that just objectively, this is a better movie than uh, the remake. I think there are good things about the remake, but I don't think it's as good as this one.